Dwight Eisenhower would win the presidency in 1952 against Democrat Alday Stevenson. He won pretty easily. It should come as no surprise that Eisenhower won as he was the face of the U.S. Army during World War II and was very popular as a result. I guess the Republicans were looking to use the age-old Whig strategy of using a popular general to coast into the election. Let's hope that Eisenhower doesn't die within the first year this time. Eisenhower would win this election in a landslide and this ended 20 years of Democratic presidencies, which was also just the last two videos. When it comes to the cabinet, the Secretary of State was John Dooles, who was replaced by Christian Herter in 1959 after dying from death. The Secretary of the Treasury was George Humphrey, who was replaced by Robert Anderson in 1957. The Secretary of Defense was Charles Wilson, who was replaced by Neil McElroy in 1957, who was replaced by Thomas Gates Jr. in 1959. I sure hope this change in defense secretaries doesn't continue. I don't think that's good for internal stability. The Attorney General was Herbert Brownwell, who was replaced by William Rogers in 1958. The Secretary of the Interior was Douglas McKay, who was replaced by Frederick Seaton in 1956. The Secretary of Agriculture was Ezra Benson. The Secretary of Commerce was Sinclair Weeks, who was replaced by Frederick Mueller in 1959. The Secretary of Labor was Martin Duncan, who was replaced by James Mitchell in 1953. And we got a whole new cabinet position, folks. The Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, to which I will refer to as the Department of Health because I'm not saying that every time, would be created in April of 1953. It would be headed by Avita Holt Hobby, who was replaced by Marion Folsom in 1955, who was replaced by Arthur Fleming in 1958. The cabinet of Eisenhower was relatively stable, at least compared to Truman. Eisenhower had also had his cabinet briefed on the duties of the department by Truman's cabinet, with the exception of Hobby, who was heading a cabinet that wasn't created until Eisenhower's presidency. As always, there will also be a video explaining the department. Eisenhower's domestic policies called for reduced taxes, a balanced budget, a decrease in federal control over the economy, and a return of some federal responsibility to the states. Government control over rents, wages, and prices were allowed to expire, and some taxes were revised and Eisenhower would give back control of the oil land to the states, but other than this, Eisenhower would keep most of the policies that were set by FDR and Truman in the new and fair deals. Budget deficits would occur in five of Eisenhower's eight years, the minimum wage was increased to $1 an hour, and the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare was created while Social Security was broadened. Eisenhower would find trouble mostly within his own party as he defeated the Bricker Amendment, which was a 1954 amendment to the Constitution that would have limited the president's power to conduct international treaties that violated the rights of states. This would have made it effectively impossible for the United States to conduct foreign policy and would have pushed the nation back into isolationism. Eisenhower would also deal with the threat of Senator Joseph McCarthy, who looked to purge communism from the U.S. government through the Red Scare. Hundreds of federal employees would be fired from government offices at the mere mention of communism. The American Communist Party was also banned. McCarthyism would wane down in 1954, as America would come to its senses and realize that maybe we shouldn't be purging out everyone that we assume is a communist. McCarthy was also censored by the Senate after he tried to go down on the army for potential communists. But despite his downfall in the span between 1950 and 1954, McCarthy was one of the most powerful men in the nation, and even the mention of a person's name would be able to make them fear for their job security. Eisenhower was not a fan of McCarthy, but he was powerless to stop him, as the court of public opinion was on McCarthy's side at that time, and that was pretty much all McCarthy needed to do what he needed to do, or I guess wanted to do. When it comes to foreign policy, Eisenhower and his Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, would work on collective defense agreements and threaten the Soviets with massive retaliatory power, which would be the basis of mutually assured destruction, or MAD. Eisenhower would also use the Central Intelligence Agency to overthrow governments in Iran in 1953 and Guatemala in 1954. In Iran, Eisenhower overthrew Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh and replaced him with Shah Mohammad Pahlavi. This was done in order to install a puppet regime in Iran. In Guatemala, the CIA removed President Jacob Arbenz Guzman and successfully got him to resign. This was done because Guzman had previously made a land reform program in 1952 that enraged U.S. planters. And due to American interests, Eisenhower, or the CIA, would perform a coup against him. A lot of stuff is still murky in this event. Was Eisenhower where the CIA led coup? Did Eisenhower do it for personal reasons as he owned stock in the American companies that owned land in Guatemala? Who let Scott Foster be the head referee in Game 7 of the 2018 Western Conference Finals between the Rockets and Warriors, despite the fact that he's bad at his job? We may never get the answer to these questions about the Guatemala coup, but what this coup would lead is to Eisenhower receiving a lot of flack in the future, but not at the moment since the public didn't know or care at the time. This would become a trend throughout the Cold War as the CIA gained power and cooed more countries.
Eisenhower would also create the International Atomic Agency with 67 other countries in 1957. This would help to promote cooperation in the nuclear field. He would also create the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization in 1954, known as CEDAW. It would include the United States, France, Great Britain, Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines, Thailand, and Pakistan. This organization was basically just Pacific NATO. West Germany was also added to NATO as well during this presidency. The U.S. would also sign a defense pact with the Nationalist Chinese forces in Taiwan, but this pact also impeded on the Republic of China's ability to invade the People's Republic of China and establish the rule that they formerly had, which I don't think they would have been able to do anyway, even without that. Mao pretty much had them on the ropes at that point. Eisenhower would also help to partition French Indochina into the Communist North, led by Ho Chi Minh, and the Non-Communist South, headed by a democratic government, providing financial and military aid to the latter, effectively setting the stage for the Vietnam War that will take place over the next decade. The U.S. would pretty much ally in favor of South Vietnam as war broke out between the two sides almost immediately. Eisenhower would win the election again against Stevenson in 1956, despite suffering a heart attack. Eisenhower would also easily win the election against Stevenson in a landslide victory yet again. Walter B. Jones would also gain an electoral vote as an elector from Alabama didn't want to vote for the more liberal Stevenson, which sounds about right for Alabama. Eisenhower would also have to deal with foreign policy in the second term. When it comes to that, he would have to deal with the Suez Crisis, where Israel, Great Britain, and France would attack Egypt for control of the Suez Canal, which would be solved as both the U.S. and Soviets both supported Egypt, forcing Israel, France, and Great Britain to back down. The three countries invaded because the Suez Canal was nationalized by the Egyptian government under Gamal Nasser. Nasser took over the canal in order to pay for the Aswan Dam that the U.S. promised to build but never did. Nasser also took Soviet arms, which meant that they were no friends with the Western governments, but they also weren't entirely friends with the Soviets either. France would join Britain in fighting Egypt because France believed that Egypt was funding rebels in Algeria, which was controlled previously by France, and Israel joined them because Egypt and them are pretty much always at odds, and they were always at each other's throats. Neither nation would pass up on the opportunity to join a coalition and invade the other. The U.S. would get involved after the Soviets threatened nuclear missiles to end the conflict. Eisenhower would tell the USSR to leave and threaten sanctions on the coalition of France, Britain, and Israel, which was enough to stop the invasion. Israel got out of there pretty much unscathed, but Britain and France, who were once the largest colonial powers in the world, have now been forced to take a backseat to the U.S. and USSR, damaging their egos. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Eisenhower would also introduce the Eisenhower Doctrine, which was a doctrine that pledged to send troops to any Middle Eastern nation that needed help for stopping communism. This would lead the United States to beginning economic and military cooperation with friendly nations in the Middle East, like Israel and Saudi Arabia. The doctrine would be first put into action in Lebanon in 1958, as civil strife led to the U.S. having to quell disturbances in the country. When it comes to domestic issues in the second term, Eisenhower would send federal troops in 1957 to defend the verdict of Brown versus the Board of Education made in 1954 after Arkansas Governor Fabius planned to oppose the ruling which desegregated their schools. Eisenhower would send in the National Guard to quell riots in Little Rock after nine African Americans enrolled in a school. Eisenhower would be criticized by both sides, as those on one side believed that he didn't do enough, and those on the other believed he went too far in asserting federal power over the states. Eisenhower would also pass the Civil Rights Act of 1957, which would be the first Civil Rights Act passed since 1875. This law would create the Civil Rights Division within the Justice Department, and would empower prosecutors to go after those who interfered in the right to vote. The Civil Rights Commission was also created, which would investigate discrimination and call for correct measures. In 1957, the Soviets would launch Sputnik 1, which occurred on October 4th, my birthday. Happy birthday to me and Sputnik 1. More importantly, however, this would launch the space race between the U.S. and the Soviets. Eisenhower would create the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, in 1958 in order to respond to the Soviet Union going into space. In honor of NASA, I will be wearing my Jordan Alvarez Space City jersey for the rest of the video. Pretty cool, isn't it? An economic recession would also occur in 1957 that would last only a year, and Eisenhower would do nothing about it in fears of bringing about inflation. It only lasted a year, so no big deal, I guess. Worked out well for the Howard. After the death of his Secretary of State in 1959, Eisenhower would take more personal role in foreign policy, traveling to 27 nations. He would also become the first president to use television as a means of communicating with the public. Our presidents still do that to this day, although some prefer Twitter. At the end of this administration, in 1961, Eisenhower would also break ties with Cuba, who had been under communist rule for Fidel Castro for two years at that point. Boy, I sure hope it doesn't come to play a role in the very next administration. It does. Kennedy would win the election in 1960 to become the replacement for the two-term Dunn-Eisenhower. 
Eisenhower was the first president to win a second term after the terms past that became banned. Eisenhower was, at the same time, a continuation of the Democrats' policies during Truman and Roosevelt, and the precursor to the more conservative modern Republicans during Nixon and Reagan, mostly Reagan. That is no easy tightrope to walk. Eisenhower led the nation for eight years through many foreign hardships and laid the groundwork for many international institutions. I will put him behind Polk. Join us next week as John Fitzgerald Kennedy takes office and becomes the last president to be assassinated so far. Oops, did I spoil the ending? My bad, just tune in next week.